piece. Now, what I'm going to have to say for the next little while uh, is going to be about peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace enforcement, peace support, peace whatever. You know, we've got all kinds of definitions, but I think peace whatever kind of sums it up. We do whatever the government tells us to do, and we give it to the military and the civilian folks to figure out the best way to do that, and they're very, very good at that. Some of the things I'm going to say are going to be, are going to be critical uh, and political, uh, but it's designed to be uh, you know, a reality check, because Canadians need to understand what we are asking our men and women in and out of uniform to do. So, and some of it's going to be uh, maybe redundant. I prefer to call it reinforcing. And, you know, the Canadian's view of Canada's history is kind of summed up in, in two monuments, the Peacekeepers Monument in Ottawa and the War <coughs> Memorial. The one on the left is, is real, uh, but it's not the entire plan. The one on the right, of course, more reflects what Canada's done as one of the most warlike countries in the world at the right time for the right reason. And of course, we've talked about Lester Pearson and the good work that he that he did back in the day. Just to not recap a whole lot, but peacekeeping, to me, peacekeeping, quote unquote, changed Cold War and post-Cold War. You know, during the Cold War, it was interstate. Turkey and Greece, Cyprus, best example. Two nations that were having a problem with each other, wanted somebody in between, and Canada fulfilled that role admirably. And others uh, that have already been talked about, Sinai, Golan, Hispanic countries in, in, uh, in South America and so on. Uh, my only really issue with Cyprus was in 1974, I was stationed in Baden, and Canadians living in, in Germany at the time used to take the, the 707 or the Yukon down to, uh, down to Greece, down to Cyprus for a, a week on the beach. Unfortunately, we are trip booked in 1974 when the Greeks and the Turks decided to have a punch up over Greece, so we had to cancel that holiday. So I'm really PO to the Greeks and the Turks. <laughs> Peacekeeping now, or peace whatever now, uh, post Cold War, and again it's been mentioned, is not interstate anymore, it's intrastate between a hopefully legitimate government and forces trying to overthrow that government or disrupt the, uh, the population, the operation, uh, and so on. It's, it's you know, a chaotic mix of, of tribal militias, terrorist groups, uh, you know, dysfunctional governments, corrupt governments, that sort of thing. And it's changed from the, the Blue Beret guys a lot of it's changed to combat, and a lot of it's changed to folks coming home in pine boxes. There's been 1,300 peacekeepers killed uh, on peacekeeping operations since 2002. So it is not without risk at all. Now, did we, did we abandon peacekeeping, or did peacekeeping abandon us? Now, through uh, things like uh, Somalia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Srebrenica, the, the horrible, horrible things that went on there, not just Canada. You know, people like to blame Stephen Harper sometimes for you know getting us out of that. But looking at July 2016, you know we were we only had 103 people on operations. USA had 68, Australia had 39, and so on. A whole bunch of other folks got the same message that the UN is really not doing what we collectively hoped, thought, wished they would do. So a whole bunch of countries represented by the flags there did the same thing as Canada and just stopped or seriously cut back the amount of effort we put into for a classic UN peacekeeping. So how did we get here and and why? The how we, we got here, and this is not critical, you know, Justin Trudeau won the election fair and square, he has a perfect right to do uh, what he's doing as the, as the leader of the country, um, and it's laudable what we are trying to do. The, the overall goal of what we're trying to do is, is, is very laudable. Uh, we need to do a couple things, make sure it's in Canada's interest in some way, and world peace obviously is in Canada's interest. But the, the note at the bottom, you know, kind of struck me. Nostalgia is sel seldom a wellspring for sensible policy. And, you know, the Prime Minister grew up in an environment where obviously his dad was involved in things and, and they knew the Pearsons and so on. And all that was great. But is it, is it nostalgia? Is it a sensible policy? Now, the why we got here, and this may be a little cynical, but I think there's a fair bit of truth to it. Uh, the United Nations Security Council election is in 2021. And we are, we, Canada, through the Prime Minister, which is his perfect right to do that, uh, are determined that we're going to win a seat on the Security Council in 2021. Norway and Ireland are our two competitors. And, you know, to be honest, what would a two-year stint on the Security Council do for us? Not much, other than make us feel good about ourselves. Because, frankly, Security Council has not accomplished very much 
uh, since I've been paying any attention to it. There was a, a fellow named uh, Anthony Banbury, who was the Assistant Secretary General for Field Support until the 5th of February this year. And he quit uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, and, and you can read his, his quote there. Obviously, he's not complimentary about his organization. And the peacekeeping office in the United Nations is, is overstretched, undermanned, serial scandals with respect to sexual abuse, uh, disease, self-serving bureaucracy, a whole bunch of bad things. The United Nations would be a great organization if they fulfilled the mandate that they were instituted to fulfill. Uh, but in my view and others' view, I think they haven't done that. Now, when we get into doing things like peacekeeping, like Afghanistan, like whatever sort of military civilian operations we get into, there's primarily two departments involved. Uh, DFAT, or now Department of, of Global Affairs, and DND. Now the question is, who's in charge? And who should be in charge are the folks at the bottom with most of the skill sets, the vast majority of the skill sets that will allow that mission to be uh, to be successful. And, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Nick Grimshaw would, would agree with me from his experience in Bosnia and, and, and certainly Afghanistan, that it's necessary to have those folks from Global Affairs involved and, and other civilians involved, but to me, they shouldn't be running the show. And there's always, between D&D &D and Global Affairs, there's a huge amount of competition, uh, unhealthy competition about, you know, I'm in charge, no, I'm in charge. Now, I'm biased, having worn a uniform, but to me, uh, there's there's no way that, that the military should be relied on a whole lot more for, for leadership. But that's just not the way it works. Now, I do. I will give, certainly give the Minister of National Defense credit. He has been trying very hard to raise the level of awareness about the risk that we are facing, and I give him great credit for that. Uh, the guy in the top, who I got to know extremely well and personally close up uh, through the Taliban detainee issue, had been locked in a room with him for way too long, reading 20,000 pages of Taliban detainee documents, looking for that needle in the haystack that just wasn't there. And again, not to be too critical of, of my friends to fend on, but can you pick out the peacekeeping expert over there? I don't think it's the guy on the left. Now, and again, I don't mean this to be too partisan, but the point is we've got people like Stefan and others who are well-meaning, are educated, are sincere, but don't have the breadth of knowledge and experience that people like Lou McKenzie have, or people like Nick Grimshaw have, in, in uh, doing the job. The other aspect, the other political aspect, is you know, making the call. <coughs> the government, the Prime Minister, is perfectly within his rights to, to make the commitment. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You may, you may know there's an election down south in a couple of months, and a lot of talk from Donald Trump and Hillary and, and so on and so on. The President of the United States has far less power within his government, or her government, than the Prime Minister of Canada does within our government. The Prime Minister of Canada is, is and I would say this about any Prime Minister, whether it's Stephen Harper, Justin Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau, whoever, can be virtually a dictator. And some enjoy that more than, more than others. <laughs> but the, my point in making the call is the Prime Minister is perfectly within his rights to make that call. However, it would be nice to have it validated, at least, by Parliament. And people dumped on, on Stephen Harper for a bunch of things, but he did bring all those things to Parliament for a vote. And that just, and to quote him, he said, it's important to be able to tell diplomats, relief workers, and soldiers on dangerous missions that Canada's parliamentarians believe in their objectives and support what they're doing. And he said that just before we uh, upped the ante in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so we, we did hold votes, and, and the Liberals should hold votes. Any government should hold votes and debates on that in the House of Commons, just to educate Canadians and nothing else about what we're, what we're getting into. Now, where we're getting into, undoubtedly, is Africa. And to put it mildly, it's a complex and dangerous place. There is no safe spot in Africa. Absolutely none. Now, what we've been doing uh, and this all goes back to, you know, are we, are we ready, is a lot of fact-finding, and that's good. That helps in, inform folks within government who, who, you know, don't have the background uh, and, and knowledge and experience, helps inform them so that they can make a smarter decision 
or stay out of things that are, are dumb. Uh, now they're taking some time doing that and I, and I applaud that. Are they stalling because they're really not sure which way they're going? There might be a, uh, an element of that, but that's, if you don't know where you're going, then for God's sake, don't try to go there. You know, so stalling is not necessarily a bad thing. So they've been around to all these countries, uh, the uh, DRC, Uganda, well, I got Uganda twice, I guess they went there twice. One of those was supposed to be Kenya, uh, Ethiopia and, and Tanzania to, to check out the lay of the land, not necessarily to go there, but just, you know, because we're going to be operating in some place there, and those other countries around it are going to have a role to play, perhaps with a, a hub, you know, support hub, that sort of thing. So we've come down, I think, to a number of, of candidates that seem to be, you know, these seem to be the folks that are talked about most as, as places we will wind up going. Uh, Chad, DRC, Central African Republic, and Mali. And each of those places already has a dog to breakfast of multinational missions. So where do we go? The odds on favorite, I think, is Mali. From everything I'm seeing and reading and hearing, and uh, I'm part of an internet uh, or email chat group, I'll call it, with about 20 retired general officers, admirals, uh, diplomats, one member of parliament, uh, some media, some great media like Matt Fisher. And we discuss a whole lot of things. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, in that group. And for them, because they've got networks, you know, far and wide. And Mali seems to be the place for one big reason, I think, and that's France is there now. Because all these other places, there's a whole bunch of countries involved who are you know, not as reliable as we maybe would like to have somebody to work with. France is pretty reliable. I mean, they've got a ton of experience. Mali is a former French colony. We've worked with the French in, in Mali uh, before. So they're, they're pretty reliable. And you know, to, to go back to the Prime Minister's, what I think one of his objectives is, is the Security Council seat. Uh, France does have some, uh, some sway in that uh, venue. And if we earn brownie points, from them for going to Mali with them, that may help the cause of the Security Council. I will point out that there have been 100 peacekeepers killed in Mali in the last two years. So it is not a safe place. So just a little bit about, about Mali. It's a French, former French colony. The area uh, is Manitoba and Saskatchewan combined, about 14 and a half million people. It is a democracy, multi-party democracy, not a smooth, stable one. Uh, they've got an economy that's, that's mostly agriculture and fishing. They've got some natural resources. Their per capita GDP is 707 bucks compared to Canada's 41,000. The average salary is about 1,500 bucks. They are 176th on the Human Development Index, which tells you what kind of an environment we'd be in. <coughs> we're ninth, by the way, we're not first. Um, I think Norway's first. The language is, is primarily French plus 40 African. Uh, languages. Of course, that's one of the reasons why we would do relatively well in Mali because of our, you know, generally speaking, our capacity for French. One of the challenges, of course, is the makeup of the country, the uh, demographics. They're 90% Muslim, 5% Christian, 5% indigenous. And there's a number of bad guys, some Tuareg rebels, some Islamist rebels, mainly up in the north, and something called the Messina Liberation Front. So it's, it's, a, it's not a pretty place. The keys to mission success, and uh, Nick you know, talked about some of them, but the big one for me is a realistic assessment of all aspects. We better cover everything. D&D is extremely good at that kind of contingency planning of covering everything. Global Affairs is pretty good at that. But we need to understand the mandate, the expectations, what defines success. If we don't know what defines success, then we better not start. The force requirements, how many people do we need, how much stuff do we need, basic, they are going to be based obviously somewhere in Mali, they're going to have one base, two bases, they're going to be a support base somewhere else, there's going to be a transit base like we had in and out of Afghanistan, uh, and security, how do we provide security for that place, the kind of training we need, which has got to be culture and, and uh, mission specific, the kind of threats we're facing, I mentioned a couple of the rebel groups, rules of engagement have to be very, very clear, I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, command and control has to be effective and swift. And using the term United Nations and command and control together doesn't imbue me with, with confidence. Personnel protection. You know, we're there to do a job, but any commander would tell you, you know, his primary concern is protecting his folks. And allied support. In France, you know, I'm not really comfortable in Africa anywhere, but I'm probably more comfortable in Mali with a reliable ally, allied France. Logistic support, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. 
an exit strategy. What is plan B? If really things really turn to the hell in a handbasket, how do we get our, our folks out of there? The big thing is, for me, is go in there with your eyes wide open or you're going to hurt yourself. But people say, the UN's going to pay us. That's great. We're going to pay our soldiers. Well, the UN will pay about $1,300 a month per soldier. That's about $12 million a year for our kind of deployment. That might pay a Bangladeshi soldier, but won't help D&D &D much. That $12 million bucks might pay for the fuel for one, one rotation. And Canadian government in the past, because we've always got those kind of payments from, from the UN, but we've always used that to offset our dues to the UN. So it doesn't come back to D&D &D in such a piddling amount, it wouldn't matter. And of course, there's incremental mission costs. That was one of the banes of the Afghanistan mission. There's about $3 billion. You know, D&D &D doesn't plan to go to war. It just happens. They don't plan for floods, ice storms. They just happen. And D&D &D has to respond, and they do wonderfully every time. But there's a cost. In Afghanistan, that cost at one point was about $3 billion that is supposed to come back to the department. It never did. There's going to be incremental costs with whatever mission this is. And I predict that, and I blame our government too, but I don't think this government's going to be indifferent, that will be a challenge in compensating D&D uh, &D for those kind of costs. They have no option but to spend. So on the costing side, a whole bunch of, of countries, mostly third world folks, Bangladesh I mentioned, and, and so on, a whole bunch of other ones, have done a lot of this because, frankly, that's how they pay their soldiers, is, is, is through this. Now, rules of engagement, and uh, Nick touched on that, you know, it, they've got to be robust. And everybody, all of our allies in there have got to be on the same level. We've got to be able to action intelligence, and we've got to be able to yeah, preemptively use deadly force. This is not sort of sit back, wait till you're shot at, You've got to use intelligence, you've got to use you know, understanding of the, of the enemy and so on to do that. And because ultimately, I mean, one of the things we're there to do is protect civilians. And if we've got people like I ask who, I, I ask who we know are going to kill civilians, we've got to be able to kill them before they get to pull the trigger. And rules of engagement can be constraining. Just an example, different context, but the F-18s in, in Iraq and Syria, an F-18 pilot, they did great work over there. They should still be there. That's another story. An F-18 pilot, could not make the decision to, to drop the bomb. He could make the decision to not drop the bomb, but he couldn't make the decision to drop it. That decision was made in uh, Qatar by four people. There was a, a pilot, a lawyer, uh, uh, an EOD guy, an intelligence guy. And any one of those four people had a red card. And they were getting stuff pretty much real time from the cockpit, from the sensors. And any one of those guys could say, no, don't like it, and go drop it. So the pilot could not override those. And sometimes that caused some problems. And there's some, some good reasons for it. But that to say, I mean, the rules of engagement have to be robust. They also have to be realistic to say that we, we can't afford mistakes. Because if we kill one wrong person, that's going to be the story. Never mind if we might have saved 500 if we killed wrong, one wrong one. What's that movie? Uh, Helen Mirren is in it. Anyway, I, I forget it. But uh, it's a great movie. It's about that. Effective command and control. Can we expect effective command and control from an organization like that, and that's the UN Security Council, in any kind of a realistic or, or timely way? I don't think so. You know, non-UN forces have gone in and saved UN operations. Uh, in Sierra Leone, Mali, and the Congo, all forces from, uh, from the Brits, from the French, and from the African Intervention Unit went in to those places and saved the UN's butt because they couldn't command and control anything. Or can we expect decent command and control from places like that, that are manned by Canadians, you know, Americans, Brits, French, folks who are knowledgeable, have real-time connectivity, have the communications capability to actually make a decision and actually transmit it in, in real time so something good happens. You know, UN, UN command and control is an oxymoron. And the example, the biggest example I think most of us are probably aware of is Rwanda and Romeo Dallaire, who I, we served together in Europe, he was Army, I was Air Force, but we knew each other casually. And of course, that didn't turn out so well. And Matt Fisher, who's a great journalist, if there's a crappy place in the world, Matt Fisher's been there reporting on it. And I was chatting with me the other day, and he was reminding me of a conversation. He, he, was, he was with Romeo Dallaire in Kigali, or wherever they were. He was on the phone 
we have Kofi Annan, who was not the Secretary General at the time, he was, he, but he was Romeo's boss in New York. And Romeo was trying to tell him the extent of what was going on. And it was, as we know, it was, it was absolutely horrific. And Matt could hear Kofi Annan in his smooth voice, reassuring the general that, no, no, sorry, general, you must be exaggerating. It can't be that bad. And you know, it's Friday, and there's a long weekend here in New York. So, you know, we'll get back to you Tuesday, and, and, and we'll, we'll sort it out. And of course, we all know what happened. It didn't turn out well. And one of Romeo's quotes was, you know, the worst, the worst eyes that haunt me are the eyes of those people who totally bewildered Mr. Commander Romeo Blair told PBS's Frontline, they're looking at me in my blue beret and asking, what in the hell happened? How come I'm dying here? And they were right. So I don't have a lot of faith in, in the UN. I do have faith in the French and the Brits and the Americans and ourselves. We need to make sure that we've got control of the command and control. Training is a big issue. Uh, again, Nick touched on that, but military and civilian. And you know, in Afghanistan, obviously it was mostly military, but there were a lot of civilians, and, and many of them were really, really top-notch, first-class people. But there was a bit of a challenge in getting defate at that time to put their people through the kind of training they really actually needed to go out and do the things they were doing at the PRC, uh, the uh, um, Predatory Reconstruction Team, PRT, PRT. PRCs are the guys that do other things. Uh, but it, it takes time, and it's mission-specific, has to be obviously related to the threat, has to be the ROE, has to be the culture, a combination of military and civilian operations, and sometimes that worked well, sometimes it doesn't work well. There were some successes in Afghanistan, but I think it had to develop, and there were some, there were some uh, cultural issues between DND and DFATE at that time. And a lot of it is, uh, is understanding. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Rideau Institute. It's actually about three people. It is a self-proclaimed voice of the NDP federally. And they bring up, well, you know, we have to do things by the peacekeeping principles, which are consent of main conflicting parties, impartiality, and defensive use of force. Okay, that sounds like Cyprus to me. So, and that's a chapter six operation which says, you know, there's, there's no imminent conflict and so on. Uh, and there's a form of truce. So in Mali, for example, are we gonna get consent from the Islamic State? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Are we going to be impartial between Malians and Islamic State people who are slaughtering women and children? I don't think we need to be impartial in that situation. And are we, already, are we going to use defensive ROE against somebody like the Islamic State? No, I'm sorry. We've got to kill them first. Mali will be a Chapter 7 operation, which recognizes there's a serious threat to world or regional peace, and the UN force is charged to deal with that. And you know, to take the Rito Institute definition and put it to Afghanistan, of course, it was very kinetic. We had tons of battles with, with the Taliban, but it was also population-centric, very, very much. In terms of protecting and engaging the population, rebuilding structures, institutions, training, local infrastructure, dealing with, with the villagers, you know, at their level. So, are we ready for Mali? I think our soldiers are indeed ready, but are the rest of now, operations is, there's a saying uh, that operations is the rose and logistics is the stem upon which it grows. Because you can have the world's greatest operation, if you can't support it, it's not going to last very long. So we need a massive amount of support for something like Mali. We need airlift support. We only have five C-17s. We've got 17 Hercs and we've got five uh, Airbuses. And of course, they're doing a whole bunch of other stuff. Are we going to have aviation support in theater, whether it's Chinooks, Griffins? The Griffins and Chinooks did, did tremendous work in Afghanistan. And we're going to need aviation support from somebody. If it's not from the French, then it might have to be from us. Personnel protection is critical. You know, things like the Lav and, and, and the Cougar and the Nyala, which is the bottom right guy. Uh, we need to protect our folks. We don't need to do what we did in Afghanistan now this is not an actual event, it's a, an IED, how an IED deals with the Iltis Jeep. And of course we sent our folks to Afghanistan at Iltis Jeeps initially. We learned that lesson and we can't ever do that, so we need to protect our, our folks. And simple things, like feeding. You know, we got a, a bunch of folks we've got to feed, and I suspect we'll probably wind up feeding some of the population as well, because that's kind of what we do. Even if, and probably especially if, 
the bottom picture if the, if the governor general shows up for lunch. <laughs> he needs to be fed. Things like communicating home. You know, in, in Af Afghanistan, there were, there were computers. Folks could get on the phone every day if they're not you know, out doing, the, doing Taliban stuff. I mean, these are all you know, individually sort of little things, but they are really, really important. That if we're going to run an operation, especially for, a, especially for an extended period of time, you've got to have those things in place. And medical. You know, that's the, the Kandahar Institute of Surgical Science, and I know Nick is very familiar with that place. Um, bottom left picture, there's going to be blood on the floor. There's going to be blood on the floor, and it's going to be Canadian blood, and we need to be able to look after it. Now, I have no idea what kind of facilities the French have there. I'm sure they have something. We'll probably rely on them, but we'll, I think we'll need our own medical folks there at some, at some level. Uh, bottom right picture is just me and, and a young guy named uh, Dennis Marion, uh, who's a Canadian uh, medical officer that was in, in Afghanistan. Uh, our folks are going to get hurt, and we need to be able to look after them. And the other challenge, of course, is we've got so many other missions going on. You know, we've got a mission in Ukraine, we've got a mission in the Mediterranean, Iraq and Kuwait is ongoing. We've got a mission in Niger, in Latvia, Poland, and other ongoing commitments. And that's on top of all the UN ones that, that, that Nick mentioned. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on. Canada has a lot of capacity because we've got people with an awful lot of capacity, but there is a limit. So we, we do need to make sure that Canada, and the Canadian Armed Forces capacity, is able to handle it. Eyes wide open. And finally, you know, Canadians love, 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 quote unquote, peacekeeping. But are they ready if this turns to that? And I think it's unrealistic to think that there's not going to be some of that. And just like in Afghanistan, Canadians love what we're doing and they should have. They love the people who are doing it and they should have. But you know, the enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the mission obviously drained every time there was another Trenton arrival. And I was at a, a few of those. Uh, you know, the enthusiasm drained, and that's, and that's normal. So we've got to communicate with Canadians politically. Uh, we've got to make sure they understand what we're getting into. We've got to make sure, and they, you know, if I'm government, I want to make sure I understand what we're getting into and what the risks are. Uh, and not just the political risk, but the human risk, and they're both substantial. And uh, some of you earlier mentioned PTSD. You know, we're going to get, you know, another wave of PTSD from wherever we go. There's going to be another another wave of that. And it'll probably be measurable, um, and it's it's inevitable. But it's something we have to be aware of. Uh, prevent or condition people to to the extent possible, but be prepared to deal with when it inevitably happens. Do we have a role? that we should be prepared to play? Yeah, I think we do. But it goes back to the little slide of the, of the little baby with his eyes wide open. Let's make sure our eyes wide open and understand what we're getting into so we don't get too surprised. We will get surprised, there's no question. So we don't get too, too surprised. Anyway, uh, I said it'd be a little bit political. It was. Uh, I hope it added some perspective. I hope it added a little bit of reality check for some things we're gonna face. And, uh, and I look forward to the rest of the, of the session and a chat afterwards. Thanks so much.